next one, which comes from Joshua Lazoya, who says, how can you say that global warming doesn't exist when most scientists say that it does? I'm not denying that global warming exists. I'm not denying that global cooling exists. The climate has been warming and cooling all the time. The climate is in a perpetual state of motion. They lost the argument when they stopped calling it man-made global warming and started referring to it as climate change. And the reason they lost the argument that instant is because the climate has been changing since the Earth has been here. If you look at the history of the Earth's temperatures going all the way back to the existence of the Earth, using whatever methods are able to use to determine how, how temperatures were, use biomass temperature measurements and calcium, all, all this stuff, ice cores, all this jazz, you find that the Earth has been in a state of constant flux. The temperature of the Earth has been changing constantly. So the second that they stop saying man-made global warming and start saying climate change, it's over. They lost. Because man-made global warming is a once-in-history crisis and catastrophe that deserves to be dealt with. But global uh, climate change is like saying the, we, we've got to stop um, your, the, your, your breathing. You like stop the planet breathing. That's like trying to say we've got to stop the waves. The climate has been changing in the earth since there's been an earth. So when they say we've got to do something about climate change, think about what that says. If it gets warmer, they'll take all your money and your freedom. If it gets colder, they'll take all your money and your freedom. Any change, if a storm comes up, it's say, look at this terrible storm, even though storms are considerably less powerful than they were. Uh, just a few years ago. Then they'll bring that out too. We're decreasing the power of storms. Storms are getting weaker. Hurricanes are getting weaker. And that's not putting enough water into the ecosystem. We have to rapidly do something to increase the strength of hurricanes. And mark my words, they're going to tell you this happened. Um, so globe, when they say climate change, they lose on their face. It doesn't help them any to show that the period of steep warming that alarmed them. And look, let's just be fair here, okay? If you look at 50, if you're living in 1998, 1999, right in there, that's when the warming stopped, and you see this steep increase in warming, I would want a scientist to say this is unusual. What's causing this? That's fine. And I wouldn't mind a scientist who says, we're very concerned if this trend continues in the future. That's fine too. But when they've got everything invested in this, and then in 1998, the, the, the warming just stops, and now we have 17 years of no, uh, no, no warming at all. When, when the data that caused them to run around with their hair on fire in the first place now shows no more warming, although carbon dioxide levels continue not only to increase but to accelerate, that invalidates their theory. And if they were real scientists, they'd say they made a mistake and they'd go home and try and figure out what the real cause is. Because if global warming is caused by CO2, man-made CO2, man-made CO2 has not only been slowing down, it's been increasing. Global temperatures right around 98, 2000, have flatlined. And now the Arctic, which we were told would be ice-free this year by Al Gore 10 years ago, is in fact showing more ice, 40% more dense ice than it did two years ago. An area twice the size of Alaska, and Alaska is not tiny, ladies and gentlemen, is now under ice when it wasn't under ice two years ago. This is evidence that the theory is incorrect. And they won't accept that. And they won't accept the fact that when they talk about thousands of science, uh, to add, get a little more into your uh, question, Joshua, when most scientists say that it does, when they say most scientists say that global warming is happening, as I said, climate change is a ridiculous argument. When you say most scientists, and they'll say thousands of scientists, well, thousands of scientists are using data provided by two sets of scientists. Virtually all climate data is derived from temperature records kept and maintained by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association, that's NOAA, and by East Anglia uh, University in Britain. So all of the data sets that the thousands and thousands of people work on are controlled by two labs, basically. Both of these labs have long trails of email evidence indicating that the data sets have been faked and that every single time an adjustment has been made. And when I say an adjustment, I say, let's say that a temperature sensor in uh, Bolivia 
is reading 93 degrees Fahrenheit, and they adjust it to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And they claim they need the adjustment because, well, urban areas or because of new changes in methodology, blah, 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 blah. They keep doing these adjustments. Every single adjustment, every single one of them has been to raise temperatures. And as my friend Bert Rutan says, there's little details like when the Soviet Union disappeared in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, something like 1,500 temperature sensors went offline in Siberia because they didn't have the means to pay for them anymore. So what do you think happens to average global temperatures if you pull 1,500 sensors data out of the Arctic and you don't compensate for that? What do you think that would do? We've got all these sensors over here that are showing cold, 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 cold. Oops, they're gone. Look at that incredible climb in global temperatures. What possibly could have caused it? We know what caused it. As I said before, Bert Rutan has gotten to be a great friend of mine, and Bert is a guy who's he's a once he's a once in a lifetime out of the box genius. And Bert's job is analyzing data. Bert's an engineer. Bert deals with data. He gets flight data from flight test instruments. He has a pretty good idea of how these vehicles are going to perform before he launches them. But Bert doesn't sit down on a piece of paper, sketch out an airplane, build the airplane, and hope everything goes well. Bert sits down with a piece of paper, sketches an airplane based on what he knows about his uh, uh, background in aerodynamics. So far, so good. So far, we're with the climate people. And he has computer models that will determine various stresses and loads, and, and so far we're still with the, com with, the, with the climate people. Then Bert builds a test airplane and goes out and gets data from the real world. And when the real world contradicts his model, Bert Rutan doesn't say, the real world must be wrong. Because if Bert had that kind of arrogance, if he had the kind of arrogance that these climatologists had, his friends would be dead. His friends would die. And I mean his close friends and his business would fail because he would go out and try to build an airplane based on what he thought the data was going to say and the data came back and said no it's something different and Bert's not arrogant enough to say in a conflict between Bert Rutan's calculations and the forces of nature the forces of nature must be incorrect and that is what the climate scientists are saying the computer models don't match the observed reality therefore the atmosphere must be wrong that's basically what they say you know, I was listening to the BBC talk about this, just happened to catch it the other day. Once again, this is like two days ago, and the guy was going, we're almost out of time. We're almost out of time. Carbon dioxide levels are expanding even more rapidly than they were before. And I actually smiled this time. Actually, you know, this sounds kind of like, you know, you, you, you're kind of selling me uh, Kiana shirts here and wide collars, and, and you're kind of talking about the incredible triple-knit polyester. It's old and tired, and, 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 and it just doesn't even sound believable even to us anymore. But listening to the French scientist, and it's a brand new organization, by the way. It's the Institute of Meteorology, International Institute of Meteorology, or something like this. And you're listening to this guy, and he's saying carbon dioxide levels have actually increased at a faster rate. It's kind of a shame that the Arctic is more densely packed with ice than it was. That's a little disconcerting for him, but of course they didn't mention that on the show. They talk about what can we do now? What can governments do now? Should they just step in and ban entire industries? That's what the BBC wanted because they're fascists. But what the guy said, he had a couple things that were just interesting things to say. He would say, for example, that um, he would say that uh, the French guy is saying, uh, and carbon dioxide uh, lasts quite a long time as a pollutant. You know, he says, uh, he says some of it's absorbed by the oceans and some of it's absorbed by the, by the, um, by the biomass. But uh, he said it can, take, it can take up to, you know, 100 or 200 years for the carbon dioxide to be absorbed by the atmosphere. And I thought that is a, is a ridiculous thing to say the car because the atmosphere is made up of carbon dioxide. It take 200 years for the carbon dioxide to disappear? Disappear where? Into the atmosphere? Well, the atmosphere is made of carbon dioxide. I mean, it's, it's hydrogen, helium, methane. Uh, it's nitrogen, ox uh, obviously nitrogen. I was going with Jupiter. Nitrogen, oxygen, uh, inert gases, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and, 
And carbon dioxide's not much. I think it's a percentage. One, one or two percent of our total atmosphere is carbon dioxide. So it doesn't go anywhere. He's, even that is off, off the, the rails. Last thing I'll say about global warming is this. I mentioned Bert earlier because Bert has a, a beautiful saying. He was doing, he was crunching the data from both, both NOAA and East Anglia. And he's got a very compelling one hour uh, brief, which I'll try to boil down into a firewall or something. But it's very, very, very compelling. Uh, and he said he, he gave this and a couple of people stood up and challenged him and said, well, Bert Rutan, you're an aeronautical engineer. You're not a climatologist. Where do you get your data from? Where, how, what, what credentials do you have to present this data? And the, this is the killer, right? Bert Turnham said, you don't understand. I'm not presenting alternate data that shows that your argument is mush. I'm showing you that your data shows that your argument is mush. I read data for a living. There's no signal here. That's what Bert Rutan says to them. He says, there is no signal here. I look at your data and telling you that based on your data, your argument's mush. Um, so there you go. Uh, and when guys say like, carb I heard this on the BBC report too. It's like carbon dioxide levels have never been higher. That's a flat out lie, flat out lie. Carbon dioxide levels have been three or four or five times higher than they are right now. When they say they've never been higher, what he means is maybe they've never been higher in the industrial age. But they have not been like 20% higher or 50% higher. They are 300% higher than they are right now. And there's no model or any indication that they're ever going to get to those levels ever. So in order to kind of break this down for you, Joshua, about the global warming thing, there's th you've actually got about six different layers. You've got about six different trenches that you can fight from on this one. First of all, the first trench you can fight from is there is no longer any global warming. Temperatures have been flat longer now than they were during the spurt that caused this thing in the first place. And once they say global climate change instead of global warming, it means that there is not a trend that they're worried about. It literally means that any data anywhere, anytime can make their case. So you can fight in that trench. The second trench you can fight in is the idea that all of these data sets have been faked that there's evidence, email evidence, saying they've been faked, that the people who are the big champions for shut down everything because the world's coming to an end say openly, we cannot let this data get out because if it does, it will discredit our argument, and so on. They're not, they didn't say, we, they didn't even say we can't let them do experiments. They said this existing data cannot be revealed because if it does, it will discredit our argument. That's not science, and that's not a scientist. Scientists don't work that way. That's, so there's that argument. You've got thousands of scientists, and they're all working from two data sets. And both of the data sets have internal memos, not criticism launched at them by somebody else, internal acknowledgments that not only is their data screwy, but that every single time the data is screwy, it's because the data is lower than they predicted. Therefore, they have to lie and make it higher to match their theory. These are people trying to make the world conform to a theory. That's why they're formally socialists. That's why socialists have so much in common with environmentalists. It's not whether it's true or not. It's they want it to be true. And if they can't get the data to match what they want, then they'll invent the data. And if they can't cherry pick the data, they'll just simply forge it. So there's that argument. There's another argument that's, I think, a compelling argument. And the argument you can basically say is global warming is happening. The Earth's getting warmer and carbon dioxide levels are rising. So what? So what? What do you mean, so what? So what? What, what show me where the harm is? Well, if the temperatures are warmer, 100,000 people more a year are going to die from heat stroke. How many people freeze to death in the winter? There's a guy called the skeptical, uh, clim uh, skeptical climatologist, a Swedish guy, I think, a uh, great guy. I met him. I forgot his name. It'll come up in a second in the comments streams here. But basically what he's saying is if you take a look at the number of additional heat deaths forecast, it's something like one-fifth of the total number of cold deaths that will be prevented. In other words, a warming planet actually saves lives. Yes, some more people will die of heat stroke, but larger numbers of people won't freeze to death. But, of course, that doesn't measure into the... Uh, account or anything. There was a the same guy took took a look at the number of polar bears that were dying each year, and as it turns out, it was something like let's just say for the sake of the argument, it was 12 polar bears that were proven to have drowned because of melting ice. Turns out there's something like 60 polar bears that are killed every year by human hunting. If you want to save the polar bears, 
no one's arguing there's going to be 60 of them killed a year by human hunting. So again, that kind of, it's this kind of thing, right? It just falls apart. But so what if it's getting warmer? Here's a really interesting thing to say to somebody, you know. If you were to stand in Kansas, the state of Kansas right now, 10, 12,000 years ago, you wouldn't be able to stand on the ground in the state of Kansas because 12,000 years ago, Kansas was under about, an, about a mile of ice. It was much colder then. CO2 levels were lower. But if you go back further than that, I forget the number. It's about, yeah, Bjorn Lundberg. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, go back a 100 million years ago. The center of this country, including Kansas, was not just under a mile of ice. It was under 200, 300 feet of water. And Kansas was paradise. Kansas had on the shores brontosauruses or brachiosauruses, I suppose I should say, and there were pterodactyls flying through the air, and there were plesiosaurs swimming through the, through the waters, and there were thousands of different species of fish, and all of this life, and there were ferns, and there were palm trees, and there were all of this biosphere, and it was paradise. In the middle of Kansas, when global CO2 levers were, were twice what they are now, and sea levels had risen so high that there was an inland sea in the middle of America. And if you're all about life forms and biodiversity, that's what you want for the middle of Kansas. If you go to the middle of Kansas today, it's a wasteland. It's a wasteland that's filled with grass. All the dinosaurs have gone, all the life forms have gone, all of the pterodactyls have gone, all the plesiosaurs have gone. It's all gone. And it's gone because of this horrifically low carbon dioxide levels that we have right now because the temperatures are so low. You can make that case very easily. So which climate do you want to protect and why? You make that whole case, the, the, the whole faking case. And frankly, you can make the case that, look, there is a very small, you, you understand that everything that they're talking about comes out of computers, right? That, and that, and that carbon, and that none of, not even they claim that it's the carbon dioxide that's going to cause the temperature increase. It's the increase in carbon dioxide that's going to force the temperature increase. Virtually all of the atmosphere's heat retention is done through water vapor. Water vapor is far, 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 far more effective greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. So their argument is a little increase, a little increase in carbon dioxide will lead to a more, little bit more evaporation, but that leads to more water vapor, and it's the water vapor that does most of the work. Forcing. How do they know what these numbers are? They plug it into a computer. And if reality disagrees with the computer, then the reality must be wrong. Have you noticed, by the way, that uh, Al Gore made this mistake but have you noticed that none of these guys are able to predict things in the reasonable short term? In other words, if you're predicting, uh, a, 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 let's just say you're predicting a one degree centigrade increase in 100 years. In 10 years, you should see a tenth of a degree increase. No one's making predictions that are measurable. Al Gore said that if we don't get to work on this by 2015, he said 10 years from now in 2005, it will be too late to stop it. Well, that's another six months. I think Rush Limbaugh, genius that he is, put up an Earth death clock. And in another three or four months, according to the guru of all of this, it'll be too late to stop it. It's too late. We just blew it. So might as well enjoy ourselves, get an SUV, and have fun. And I think the final thing I'll say about this, if you really want to make an argument, is this. Um, Al Gore is, r rightly enough, I suppose, uh, considered to be the high priest of the man-made global warming catastrophe to the earth. He's the one that got all the attention in the Academy Awards. He's made hundreds of millions of dollars by offering uh, papal dispensations in the form of carbon credits. And he's the guy that said, if we don't act now, the planet's going to die. And Al Gore is rightly associated with this movement. Now, here's a point that really needs some serious thinking about. Al Gore knows he's lying. And he knew he was lying the whole time. And how can I tell you this? I can tell you this because despite what you saw in, a, in, uh, in uh, An Inconvenient Truth with Al Gore standing there alone in the, in the you know, it's 2 o'clock in the morning and Al Gore's got the red eye or the morning flight on, you know, 
uh, back to spread this message. And you see him standing there alone with his suitcases or sitting there at 2 o'clock in the morning in the terminal at the airport. Blah, 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 blah. Nonsense. He travels around in private jets. And up until it was uh, shamed him into it, he might have made some changes since then. It was revealed that Al Gore's house in Tennessee, his mansion, had an electrical bill that was not two times the average electrical bill for somebody in Tennessee or five times or ten times. His electrical bill was 30 times what the average Tennessean's electrical bill was. He was bending, he was burning 30 times as much carbon as the next guy. Now let me just tell you why you know Al Gore is a liar. If I had a theory that eating grapes caused the extinction of the earth, and I believed it in my bones, I genuinely believed it, and I thought it was my mission to convince you that humans eating grapes was the reason the earth was going to die and that you could never eat another grape again, then if I actually believe that, I can assure you that you would never see me eat a grape for the rest of my life. And you sure as hell wouldn't see me eating 30 times as many grapes as the guy sitting next to me at a restaurant, right? If I really believed it, if I really believed it in my heart, I would make sure that my electric bill was zero, that my carbon footprint was zero. And I would, in fact, take trains to symposiums or whatever the lowest uh, form of uh, carbon footprint is. If I really believed it, I would act like I believed it because I would know that all the and people, oh, what difference was your personal consumption make? Well, my personal consumption is one three hundred millionth of American consumption. But if I was the high priest of grape eating uh, or prevention of grape eating, then my personal consumption levels are going to be examined by both my followers and my um, antagonists. And the fact that Al Gore was burning 30 times as much electricity using fossil fuels as the average Tennessean is evidence that he doesn't believe it. Because if he did believe it, he'd never allow that to happen. I'll be here all night with this one. But uh, the last thing I'll close on, as I said uh, in a couple speeches, uh, and I think I'm probably going to do in, um, in this coming afterburner uh, uh, firewall. I saw a documentary back in 2004 or so, and it was one of these things. You must watch this. Your children are going to die if you don't. The planet is in danger. We're all going to we're all going to croak. Global warming special from about 10 years ago, and it was hosted by a network executive, one of the uh, I'm sorry, a network uh, anchor man, one of the top guys, and um, and it was on network news. It was a, a evening. It was an evening documentary, hour long documentary about global warming, and it was a big deal. And they promoted the hell out of it. So I watched the first little bit of it. And let's just say it was Tom Brokaw. I don't remember who, but let's say it was Tom Brokaw. And he's standing in front of the Arctic Ocean. And he, he's looking at the camera very seriously. And he says, the last time that this ocean behind me here in the Arctic has been liquid, ice-free, in September was 20 million years ago. Global warming is real. It's happening. And we have to do something about it. And I thought to myself, if 20 million years ago, the Arctic was unfrozen like it is now, whose SUVs and coal fire plants caused it to be liquid 20 million years ago? Because that seems like a reasonable question to ask if you're telling me that it's gas guzzling cars and cold fire plants that are causing this catastrophe. So if it happened 20 million years ago, who caused it then? And apparently these people can't even do that simple level of logic. They can't even put those two things together. And there's a second question that follows that, of course, and that is, if it turns out that this ice-free sea 20 million years ago, that we're, uh, this ice-free sea that we're looking at now is, is the sign of an irreversible climate disaster, how is it 
that 20 million years ago, the exact same conditions that you're seeing are happening now that are going to kill the Earth, if it happened 20 million years ago, why are we still here? In other words, if, if, the, cli if the climate went through this kind of warming 20 million years ago and there weren't even humans around, then not only what caused it, but an even better question is, how do we recover? How do we recover? How did the Earth not die? Now you really get down to the brass tacks of the issue. Because the brass tacks of the issue are pretty simple, really. This is the thing you really absolutely have to understand about this entire argument, and that's this. The Earth is a negative feedback system, and if it wasn't, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Nobody would have been having this discussion. There wouldn't have been fossils to check or, or any of that stuff because there wouldn't have been life on Earth. There's, a, there's a two different kinds of feedback. There's a steady state thing, right, where if you t touch something, it stays in a steady state. But there's a kind of a, of, a, of, a, of a positive feedback loop where if you make a change, it moves, and then it accelerates. And the more you move it, the faster it goes out of whack. And then there's a negative feedback uh, loop where if you, if you push something one way, there are forces that bring it back to the middle. Positive feedback is if you push something one way, there are forces that make it go further. The best way to visualize this that I've ever heard is imagine a bowl, just a bowl, a curved bottom bowl. And if you put a bowl down on the ground with a curvy side up, and you put a marble on the top of the bowl, and you balance the marble very delicately, the marble will stay there. But if you add a little bit of um, impetus, like just blow on it just a little bit, just the slightest bit, that breath will move that marble off the center of the bowl, and because of positive feedback, that marble will accelerate and get faster and faster and faster till it falls off the bowl. That's positive feedback. And if the Earth were built that way, then the slightest bit of warming, as they say, the slightest bit of cooling, would have sent the Earth either into a crisp or into a frozen snowball from which we never would have recovered. However, if you take the bowl and turn it upside down and you put the marble in the bottom of the bowl rather than on the top of the bowl, if you put the marble in the bottom of the bowl, now you have a negative feedback situation. So if you blow on the marble, the marble moves a little bit up the rim, but it comes right back down again. You can plink the marble. It'll move up the rim. It'll come back down again. The more you knock it, the further out it goes, and the faster it comes right back down again. And if the Earth wasn't constructed this way, if the Earth's atmosphere wasn't a negative feedback situation, we wouldn't have life on Earth. Because the first time that we had any kind of, forget humans, the first time there was an asteroid impact and all that dust went into the air and cooled the planet down, well, then the Earth would have turned into a frozen snowball, would have stayed a frozen snowball forever. The first time that volcanoes gassed enough carbon dioxide into the air to start the so-called runaway greenhouse effect, then we would have turned into Venus and we would have been a fried to a crisp, and that would have happened billions of years ago. So there's obviously something that's at work that says that if the Earth starts to get warmer and warmer and warmer, it will do that to a point at which point things will happen that will bring the Earth back down to more of a centralized temperature. Likewise, if CO2 and temperatures get a little low, there's also a mechanism that warms it back up again. Most of it's got to do with albedo. Most of it's got to do with the fact that the colder the planet gets, it affects ice, it affects all kinds of other things, or affects reflectivity. But the Earth wants to be at a more or less mean temperature, and we're right in the middle of that more or less mean temperature right now. Earth's been hotter than it is. Earth's been colder than it is. There's been more carbon dioxide, less carbon dioxide. There's nothing here we haven't seen before. And uh, so what do you say except no, do not want. There we go.